Hi, everybody. Welcome to our program today on Life Lessons and Lincoln. I would like to begin by thanking our distinguished speaker, Dr. Christian McWhorter. And I have to say, when I first started talking to Christian about this program, we were talking on the phone. He sent me his resume. And then I got his picture to use for publicity. And he's this young guy. And he's just so incredibly brilliant and has done so much already. It's just incredible. We are blessed to have him here today to share with us his expertise. So let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. McWhorter. He is the Lincoln historian at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum and the author of Battle Hymns, The Power and Popularity of Music in the Civil War. He previously served as editor of the Journal of the Abraham Lincoln Association and as a, an assistant editor for the papers of, a, of Abraham Lincoln Project. His writings on Lincoln, popular music, and the Civil War have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Chicago Sun-Times, and the Washington Post. His most recent publication is a Civil War Monitor article on what Lincoln's taste in music tells us about his worldview. He is fascinating, interesting, and accomplished. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Christian McWhorter. Well, thank you for that extremely generous uh, welcome, Susan. And thank you to the Mirrorwood Center for uh, inviting me today. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming and listening to me. I hope, uh, I hope I'm able to, to, to May, uh, teach you a little something about uh, Lincoln's life and legacy. Uh, I've certainly um, had to learn a lot about Lincoln's life and legacy uh, since I came to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. As um, as Susan said, my uh, my Civil War background is is as a cultural historian, uh, and I wrote a book on music in the Civil War. Um, but uh, you know, you, you you after you get your PhD, you get on the job market, and I ended up. Um, I ended up getting a job at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, and I've been here for about 12 years. And uh, that, you know, obviously, as a Civil War scholar, I was familiar with the Lincoln story and Abraham Lincoln, but I certainly wasn't as immersed in it uh, as I've been since uh, I started working here. And so I've, I feel like I've really kind of come to know, you know, Abraham Lincoln. And I think one of the things about Lincoln, um, Lincoln is such a monumental figure, right? Lincoln is the most written about um, most written about American uh, ever to live. Uh, he is the, depending on who you ask, he's either the second or third most written about um, person, uh, at least in the English language. Um, so he's a huge figure. And as a result, we tend to project certain things on Abraham Lincoln, which has led to a lot of myths about Lincoln. Um, but I think it also makes him a, an interesting figure when you, when you read about Lincoln. I think we can all find, you know, the, 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 the core of this talk and, and what I was asked to talk about was life lessons from Lincoln. I think we can draw, we can all draw different life lessons from Lincoln, the Lincoln story, um, from Lincoln's successes and his failures. I think the Lincoln story can speak to each of us in our own individual way, depending on what we, uh, you know, are interested in or need in at whatever stage of life we're in. I think Lincoln, the Lincoln story can also inform us depending on what's going on in the world around us, right? Like there's a kind of famous um, uh, phrase among politicians that any like major politician in America has to get right with Lincoln. You, you know, Lincoln is the small, we're all in Lincoln's shadow. Everyone who lives in America, but especially anyone who tries to be a leader in America is in Lincoln's shadow. And so you have to try to fit yourself into that legacy somehow. So in my time with Lincoln, um, What's really impressed me about Lincoln, and, and the thing that I didn't really know as much about Lincoln until I started working here and you know hanging out with Lincoln every day, um, was Lincoln as a um, as a person who was almost completely self-educated, what and was completely self-motivated. What's interesting to me about Abraham Lincoln is is he's a guy who. Um, knew uh, what he was good at and what he wasn't good at and was always willing to learn what he needed to know 
to tackle whatever was in front of them. So um, in some ways, we're all aware of this story because one of the kind of central myths of America, um, which we still argue about whether it's true or not, but one of the kind of central myths of the United States is this idea of the self-made man, right? This idea that in America, um, you know, anyone, uh, you know, it's self-made man, but now we mean anyone regardless of their gender uh, can, you know, succeed based on their own merit, right? That's part of the story of America. It's a story Abraham Lincoln believed in himself. And Lincoln is often held up as like the ultimate example of that, right? Lincoln is a guy who goes from a log cabin, you know, to the White House, right? If you've ever been to our museum here in Springfield, that's the first image you, you see. When you walk into the main plaza, there's the log cabins on one side and the White House is on the other, right? Whether all that, this idea of the self-made man, like I said, is, is, is true or not, or whether it's been more true at different times, I want to push that aside. But, but I think what you can draw from that story, though, is it's true that Lincoln, you know, really had an amazing journey from his early days to where he ended up. And a lot of that is due to these qualities that I said about Lincoln, that Lincoln is able to, um, he has this enormous capacity for self-growth. Um, so, and he never lost it throughout his life. Lincoln never gets, even when he's president, Lincoln is aware of his weaknesses and seeks to tackle them. So that's what I'm gonna emphasize today. I'm gonna take you kind of quickly through the Lincoln story, but highlighting these moments where Lincoln is faced with a situation where he has to improve himself and his dedication to self-improvement allows him to do that. Um, but let's really, let's start by emphasizing Lincoln's early days, right? I, I, I want to be clear, Lincoln is often really sold as a like rags to riches story. I think the rags part of that can be a little overemphasized. There are certainly people living in America um, who are in greater poverty than Abraham Lincoln when he's born. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is born in 1809 and he is, and he's born in a log cabin, right? Um, but his father owns a substantial amount of land. His father never really becomes a kind of wealthy farmer, but he makes do. Um, and that's the world Lincoln is born into. So um, there's, again, there's obviously people in America worse off. There's people in greater poverty. Obviously, a large number of Americans are enslaved uh, at the time Lincoln is born. Um, but it certainly is not an environment that you expect a future president of the United States to come from. It's a, it's a one-room cabin. Um, and uh, he has one sister. Um, they move in, in 1811, they move to Knob Creek, uh, Kentucky, which is near Elizabethtown, um, where Lincoln attends school sporadically. Um, Lincoln will later say he, he in his entire life, um, when, I, when I do this talk in person, I usually trick the audience and I, I ask them to tell me where Lincoln got his law degree from. And they'll all make guesses and the answer is nowhere, right? Lincoln had less than one year of formal schooling of any kind in his entire life. Um, some of that schooling begins when he's very young in Knob Creek. But in 1816, his father, partly due to issues uh, involving slavery, um, especially the slaveholding class's ability to take land from smaller farmers, um, his father, Thomas, leaves uh, Kentucky for Indiana and they settle in what is now Spencer County, Indiana. Um, and they literally carve that out of the wilderness. One, one thing I also like to emphasize when I give talks like this is Indiana, and of course later Illinois, are the frontier of white you know, colonial expansion westward, of American colonial expansion westward. They are the edge of the United States at that time. And so when his father gets into Indiana, I mean, he he stakes out a claim, but it's full of trees and he has to cut it. He has to carve the roadway they take to get to that plot of land. And then he stakes it out with four pieces of wood and then he has to carve a, a farm out of it. So, I mean, that's that's the the, the state um, of uh, the state of the state of Indiana when he gets there. Um, Lincoln's story is also haunted by tragedy that he has to rise above. Um, the first major tragedy of Lincoln's life being his mother, Nancy, passing away on October 5th, 1818. Um, Lincoln has an enormous fondness for his mother. He remembers his mother really fondly. In the context of this talk though, talking about Lincoln and self-improvement, it's worth noting though that we believe both Nancy and Thomas were illiterate. So Lincoln's parents don't even know how to sign their name. We think. Um, they might've had some limited reading skills. We don't really know, but they are illiterate people. Um, 
to give you a sense of what a different time it was and really the frontier life. So Thomas, you know, needs a, a new wife, right? To, 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 you know, at that time, right? The wife is taking care of the household while he's taking care of the farm. Thomas also worked as a carpenter, by the way. So he goes back to Elizabethtown by himself to find another wife which means he leaves Abraham and his sister, Sarah, um, both of whom are very young. Um, you know, uh, uh, Abraham uh, would have been around 10 um, by themselves on the farm and they have to take care of themselves. Um, Thomas meets Sarah Bush Johnson there and, and marries her. Um, she's a widow, she's already a widow and they come back and, and she describes Lincoln and his sister, Sarah, they, well, everybody calls her Sally. I keep saying Sarah, but everybody calls her Sally. Um, she describes Lincoln and Sally as being almost feral when, when she comes back to the cabin. I mean, they've been out there, you know, by themselves essentially for, for a few months. <clears throat> um, Sarah um, also appears to have been, you know, not really well educated and, and mostly illiterate. Um, she, uh, but Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln recalls her very fondly. Um, Abraham's sister, by the way, will pass away during childbirth, so she won't she won't live to adulthood um, or far into adulthood. Um, and uh, but they continue to go to school. So um, occasionally, again, the way it worked on the frontier is these teachers um, would travel around and basically set up shop um, near a kind of community of of pioneers, and then they would send their kids to school for a little while, and they would learn kind of the basics. Um, and then they would move on. And so, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln, like I said, calculates throughout then his childhood in Kentucky and Indiana that he receives less than a single year of schooling. And when Lincoln is asked the quality of, of his education uh, later in life, Lincoln replies with only one word, defective. So Lincoln, not only did he get very little schooling, he didn't think much of that school. So, um, so he remains in Indiana. Again, I'm just trying to give you some context here before we get into his education. He remains in Indiana until uh, March of 1830. Um, and that's when Thomas decides to move uh, to Illinois. So they, um, they get to Illinois. They settle just, I'm in Springfield, Illinois, by the way, in case y'all don't know where I am, I'm in Springfield, Illinois at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. They settle um, a little bit east of here. That year, there's this tremendous snowfall. They call it the Great Snow. Um, and so he stays with his parents for a little while, helps them set up their farm. And then the following year in 1831, he sets out on his own. And he ends up in New Salem, which is just north of here. All right, so let's back up then and talk about self-improvement in this context, right? So if Lincoln has less than a year of formal schooling and it's not particularly effective schooling, how does this guy end up being, you know, the author of the Gettysburg Address, right? One of the finest written speeches in the English language, right? Um, well, one of the ways is his own personal pursuit of knowledge. Um, several people in Lincoln's orbit. Um, so when Lincoln's on, in Indiana, he's living with cousins. There are neighbors. I mean, they're, they're a fair distance away, but there are neighbors who, who know the Lincolns. Some of them take credit for helping Lincoln, but, um, and of course they conflict, so we don't really know. Most of what we know about Lincoln's early life comes from oral interviews that his last law partner did. So that's part of the reason why Lincoln's early life is very fuzzy. We don't, Lincoln himself hardly ever talks about it. So we're, we're going from recollections of people around Lincoln. Um, and uh, what they say is that Lincoln was constantly, whenever he could carve out time, he was constantly reading. So whenever Lincoln could get his hand on a book, from a neighbor or you know, somehow he was able to acquire one from people passing by or, or whatever, a merchant, he would, he would read it. And so um, you know, we, we get these stories of you know, Thomas is having Lincoln work the field, but like the minute Lincoln's work is done, he's parking himself under a tree and he's reading a book. Um, we know that Lincoln at night when the family would all go to sleep, again, this is a one room, um, cabin, which is a little deceptive because there's kind of like an upstairs and that's where Lincoln and his cousins sleep, but still it's essentially one room and there's one fireplace, right? At night, when everybody else goes to sleep, Lincoln would sit by the fire and he would position himself. There's paintings depicting this and we have a depiction of it in our museum where Lincoln would like sit and position himself so the fire would light whatever book he was reading and then he would stay up late and read. 
Um, and it's clear that like whether Lincoln knew this to begin with, he clearly learned as he went that this was Lincoln's way out of this life, right? Lincoln did not want the life of a laborer or a farmer, right? Lincoln wanted the life of the mind. Lincoln wanted to enter the American middle class and get a some kind of build some kind of professional life for himself. He seems to have understood this fairly early. I think we could also say in today's parlance that Lincoln was clearly gifted. Link, everybody would remark on Lincoln's remarkable ability not only to tackle books, but to remember. Like Lincoln could quote, um, Lincoln was never a real religious guy, but he could quote the Bible um, from memory. He could quote Shakespeare from memory. So, so not only could Lincoln, not only did Lincoln somehow managed to learn how to read on his own, he was able, he just had an enormous capacity for retaining this knowledge. And he's doing this to educate himself. One of the most interesting documents, the earliest Lincoln document out there is what we call his sum book. Um, and it's ripped up into several pages. I mentioned Lincoln's last law partner. His name was William Herndon. And he came into possession of this sum book. And when he would um, talk to people who knew Lincoln, he would rip a page out of this book and give it to them, which as a museum person, just telling that story makes my skin crawl that he was ripping up this primary document. And so as a result, it's scattered throughout the world now. There's even pieces of it in Japan. Um, but, um, but what they are is, and if you ever see these, and, and we have a project here called the Papers of Abraham Lincoln Project that Susan mentioned I used to work for. They're, they're out of this division. Um, they've, they've actually put it up online. If you go to papersofabrahamlincoln.org, it's the very first document and it's, it's this sum book and it's been put together again because they were able to go to all these different places and digitally um, recreate it. And what it is, is there are sheets of paper where Lincoln is doing math problems. I can't figure out, like A, I'm a historian, so I'm bad at math, but B, he's doing math in a way that we don't learn math anymore. Um, so I can't really tell what Lincoln's doing on most of the pages, but it's clear that like Lincoln has got some kind of book that's teaching him how to do math. And what we've got then in those pages is Lincoln doing his math homework, but he's doing it himself. No one's making him do it probably, right? He's probably doing this himself. Um, and he's also um, being a typical kid. He's writing himself little goofy messages on it while he does it. So one of the earliest um, pieces of writing we have from Lincoln is this goofy little poem he writes himself he says, uh, this is, I've got two of them. One poem he writes himself on these math pages. He says, Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen, he will be good, God knows when. Um, cheesy jokes become a big part of the Lincoln story. Uh, another one he does is he says, Abraham Lincoln is my name and with this pen I wrote, I wrote the same. I wrote it in both haste and speed and left it here for fools to read. So, you know, he's doing these math problems, but he's still getting bored. He's writing down these little rhymes. This also is reportedly driving his father crazy because his father sees Lincoln, and this is the way most, this is the way parenting worked for most people then. He sees Lincoln as someone who's going to help him on the farm. And so there's clearly tension between Lincoln and his father that I don't think ever gets resolved um, throughout his father's life. Um, where his father wants Lincoln to be more committed to the farm. And again, all Lincoln wants to do is read <laughs> uh, and educate himself and, and get out of that life. We also know that during that time when Lincoln's a kid, one of the things that his, his friends recall about him later in life is he would give speeches, right? Obviously gonna be a big part of the Lincoln story, right? Lincoln would get up and he would mimic the adults around him and give kind of goofy speeches, especially ministers. He would get up and pretend to be the minister and give these like joking sermons. Um, so again, I mean, on the one hand, this is Lincoln being jokey, which like I said, is a big part of his personality. But I think this is also Lincoln rehearsing, right? How to speak like an adult, how to speak to a crowd. It's all part of this self-education process. And that's part of, I think, who he is too. Another factor of, of Lincoln, if we're talking about Lincoln and leadership lessons and self-improvement, Lincoln develops a very um, kind of gregarious nature. Um, we're used to seeing Lincoln as a statue. <laughs> right, as the Lincoln Memorial or something like that, we see Lincoln as a very kind of static and serious figure. That doesn't seem to have been who he was at all. Um, what Lincoln was most of the time was um, people love to hang out with Lincoln. One of the reasons why Lincoln is able to build a strong political coalition that will lead him to the presidency is people love to be around him, especially guys. Lincoln was kind of a man's man in that way. He would go out late, they would sit around the fire at the tavern, 
although Lincoln didn't drink very much, if at all. And Lincoln would tell like goofy stories and goofy jokes. Some of them were apparently a little off color too. He liked to work blue. Um, and so people love to hang out with Lincoln. And so he starts to develop that too. And that's gonna be another key to his success is that people like Abraham Lincoln. Wherever he goes, he makes friends when he's there. Um, I can give you an example of a Lincoln joke. Uh, most of the Lincoln jokes um, don't play well today because you know humor always needs context, right? So a lot of Lincoln jokes, but this is one that I think is okay. Um, and it's a preacher joke. Um, he uh this is this is this is how lincoln said told the joke he said the president uh or someone's remembering this about him they say the president so lincoln told of a southern illinois preacher who in the course of his sermon asserted that the savior was the only perfect man who has ever appeared in this world also that there was no record in the bible or elsewhere of any perfect woman having lived upon the earth whereupon there arose in the rear of the church a persecuted looking personage who the person having stopped speaking said, I know a perfect woman and I've heard of her every day for the last six years. Who was she? Asked the minister. My husband's first wife, replied the afflicted female. So that's a Lincoln joke. <laughs> that's about, so if you can, that's most of Lincoln's jokes are that way. We'd probably call them dad jokes today. Um, so, <laughs> So let's let's jump then to where we left Lincoln off, right? Because uh, because when Lincoln goes to New Salem, right, this is a man in his very early 30s. He's sitting on his own for the first time. Lincoln's New Salem story is very much reflects what he's already taught himself now about self improvement, right? He gets to New Salem. He will later recall that when he arrives in New Salem, he's like a piece of driftwood. He he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. Um, he's kind of through. I won't get into it, but like he knows about this town through a friend. It's kind of an emerging town north of Illinois or north of Springfield. It will eventually blink out of existence. So New Salem now is just a historic site. Um, it only for about seven years does this town really exist. And when he's there, he attempts several careers. Um, he attempts several jobs, and again, most of them he teaches himself. Um, his main thing he tries to do there is open a store, which he's ultimately a failure at. Um, the store goes out of business and he ends up with a huge personal debt because of it. Um, but that affords him a couple opportunities, one of which is um, he gets appointed as postmaster for the town of New Salem, his first federal job. And um, that's useful for Lincoln because what it does is uh, one of the things the postmaster did for people was the postmaster delivered their newspapers to them. And that gave Lincoln, who doesn't have much money, access to all these different newspapers. And what Lincoln would do is he would read them before he gave them to whoever was the subscriber. This matters because whether Lincoln was, was politically engaged, we don't know if Lincoln was politically engaged or motivated before he got to New Salem, but he certainly becomes that way in New Salem, right? Mostly what the newspapers are covering is politics. And Lincoln is reading about politics and he's becoming more and more committed to politics and starts to increasingly define himself as a member of the Whig party, right? At that time, America's got a two party system in the 1830s, but it's not the one we have today, right? It's the Democrats and the Whigs. Lincoln increasingly identifies himself as a Whig. And part of that is from reading these newspapers. It also allows him, owning the store and being the postmaster also allows him to meet a lot of people, right? So remember I mentioned how fun it was to be around Abraham Lincoln, right? Abraham Lincoln becomes a very popular guy in New Salem very quickly. Um, he also, one of the other jobs he engages upon is he becomes a surveyor, right? Remember I said Illinois is the frontier. So all these surveyors are going out and they're surveying land. They're trying to make, uh, they're trying to designate land for towns. They're laying out towns. Lincoln does that, but that's not an easy job, right? So that's another one of these things where we know when Lincoln gets there, he borrows surveying equipment from people around him and he learns how to do it. So again, self-improvement, Lincoln learning how to do a thing. But Lincoln's engagement with politics is clearly what appeals to him. And so he runs for office in 1832 uh, to uh, get a seat in the Illinois state legislature. Think about that for a second. This is a guy in his early twenties, and he runs for office in 1832. When did I say Lincoln got to New Salem? 1831. So a year into his time there, he's running for office. 
So that shows how politically engaged he is, and it probably also shows how popular he is, that he thinks he's got a shot. In the middle of that election cycle, um, the Black Hawk War will break out here in Illinois, which is an attempt by um, uh, an, an, a Native American leader named Black Hawk to come back to Illinois and, and uh, reclaim land that was taken away from him after the revolution and the War of 1812. Um, and Illinois mobilizes their uh, some, some federal uh, soldiers, but the state militia gets mobilized to push him back out again. Lincoln volunteers for that war. Um, what that means about Lincoln and indigenous peoples and all that, that's another talk. But in terms of the Lincoln and self-improvement story, it's important because Lincoln gets elected captain of his company. That's the way those militia units worked. It wasn't the most experienced military guy they put in charge. They would just vote for one of their members. So Lincoln is already so well regarded by his neighbors that a year into his living in New Salem, they elect him captain of their militia company. And Lincoln will say throughout his life that that was the most important election he ever won because it showed the regard his, his peers had for him. Unfortunately, though, when he gets back to um, New Salem and tries to restart his election uh, campaign, he fails. And he, so he does not get elected in 1832. He'll run again in 1834 and win election, and Lincoln will spend four years in the Illinois state legislature and will eventually become one of the most powerful Whig politicians in the state. Again, this is just a piece of driftwood, right, who showed up in New Salem. So... Another thing that we can that we can emphasize about Lincoln, right, is is he's, you know, this again. We're seeing self improvement. He gets he gets to the state capital, which at that time is in Vandalia. Moves to Springfield. A lot of credit to Lincoln for moving to Springfield while he's in the state legislature. And then it's of course again we don't know when Lincoln's interest in the law began. If he was already interested in being a lawyer when he got to New Salem, but either way, right, if you're a politician and you're hanging out with other politicians, that means you're hanging out with a lot of lawyers, right? And so it's in the state legislature that Lincoln really gets involved in learning the law, right? And I talked about how I have my trick question. I often ask audiences, where did Lincoln go to law school? He doesn't. What he does is he borrows all these law books from his political buddies, and he studies them, and he is able to pass the bar on his own um, in 1836. That sounds like, I mean, that's a big achievement. It's a little, not quite as big an achievement as it would be today. It was easier to pass the bar in the frontier state of Illinois in 1836 than it would be today, but it's still a significant achievement. Most of Lincoln's colleagues, most of the other lawyers in Illinois, guys like Stephen Douglas, went to law school um, at a university. Abraham Lincoln never did. He was able to do it on his own. And then that idea of learning these things yourself and being self-motivated, Lincoln carries with him his whole life, especially in his law degree or his law career. So I've got three quotes here from Lincoln. These are all from later in life. So later in life, young aspiring lawyers will contact Lincoln and they'll say, you know, hey, I wanna come study under you um, and learn to be a lawyer. Lincoln almost always says no to these requests. I don't think Lincoln wants these young lawyers around in his law office but he'll always give them advice. And the advice is always the same thing he did, right? He's reflecting what he did. So here, here's some examples. He says to this one guy, he says, yours of the 24th asking, the best mode of obtaining a thorough knowledge of the law is received. The mode is very simple, though laborious and tedious. It is only to get the books and read and study them carefully. Begin with Blackstone's commentaries. And after reading it carefully through, say twice, take up Chitty's pleading, Greenleaf's evidence, and Story's equity, et cetera, in succession. Work, work, work is the main thing, right? That work, work, work is the main thing, right? That's Abraham Lincoln. Here's another one. If you wish to be a lawyer, attach no consequence to the place you are in or the person you are with, but get books, sit down anywhere, and go to reading for yourself. That will make a lawyer of you quicker than any other way, right? That's Lincoln telling his own story, right? The place you are in, right? Lincoln was on a frontier farm, but he's saying, don't worry about that. Just get books, then you'll be okay. Here's the last one. He says, when a man has reached the age that Mr. Widner has, that's who he's being asked about, and has already been doing for himself, my judgment is 
that he reads the books for himself without an instructor. So Lincoln is even recommending going to law school isn't as good as doing it yourself, right? He's, he's putting his experience over that. That is precisely the way I came to the law. Let Mr. Widner read Blackstone's commentaries, Chitting's pleadings, Greenleaf's evidence, Story's equity, and Story's equity pleadings. Say, so again, all the same books he recommends to the other guy. Get a license and go to the practice and still keep reading, which again, was the other thing I've been emphasizing today, right? Even once Lincoln kind of achieves his goal, he still believes in self-improvement and learning, right? Don't just stop learning about the law when you become a lawyer, keep learning. That is my judgment of the cheapest, quickest, and best way for Mr. Widner to make a lawyer of himself. I wanna say one more thing about Lincoln's law career and, and his emerging political career, and that is Mary. Mary Lincoln plays a, a real role in this as well, because Mary is not from Abraham Lincoln's world. Mary is a very well-to-do, right? She's from a slaveholding, very politically connected Whig Kentucky family. Um, and Mary is, is basically sent by her father to Springfield to find a husband. Um, and she does with Abraham Lincoln. But like Mary, I think one way to, to look at Mary, so one thing I wanna say right off the bat, so I don't get misunderstood, I'm not saying that this was a political marriage. I think Abraham Lincoln and Mary Lincoln genuinely loved each other, especially in their early relationship. Um, and part of that is because Lincoln, Mary is everything Lincoln wants to be. Mary is super educated. Mary has years of education, um, which is exceptional for a woman at that time, right? She knows how to speak several languages. She reads Shakespeare. She's invested in politics. Of course, Lincoln is smitten with Mary. She, that's, that's what Abraham wants to be, right? And so Mary is part of the story as well, because she not only is another avenue for Lincoln to access education, but it's obviously socially a step up as well that he's marrying into this prominent political family. All right, now we're gonna fast forward all the way to the presidency because I think that's the next major test in Lincoln's uh, life and career. Because Lincoln gets elected president, right? Lincoln's election results in the deep South states at first and then the upper South states seceding from the union, right? Even though Lincoln, um, throughout Lincoln's political campaigns, um, the, the, the key component of the Republican platform that Lincoln runs on is to prevent the extension of slavery, the expansion of slavery further west into the United States. Um, and Lincoln will say over and over again, including in his first inaugural address, that that's all they've campaigned on. He's not trying to destroy slavery. He's just trying to keep it from expanding. Pro-slavery um, Southerners don't believe this. Pro-slavery Southerners see Lincoln's election and Republicans taking control of the presidency as a fundamental threat to the institution of slavery and, and a large number of them eventually decide the only way to secure the institution of slavery then is to break away and form their own country, um, their own version of the United States committed to the preserving the institution of slavery, right? Which they will call the Confederate States of America. Lincoln, so Lincoln walks into this crisis, right? First of all, he uses his skill as a lawyer to navigate it, right? The, if you read Lincoln's first inaugural address, and I recommend you do, the part we all remember about that speech is the end, right? The better late, uh, better angels of our nature and the mystic chords of memory, right? Lincoln's emotional plea to white Southerners to please don't leave. I'm not trying, you know, I'm not trying to take your enslaved property away. Please, you know, don't secede, right? But most of that speech is actually a legal argument. It's Lincoln, the lawyer, arguing why, A, he's not who they think he is, and B, that secession is illegal. So if they do it, he, as president, is going to be empowered to stop them. That's mostly what that speech is about. But when I say Lincoln is empowered to stop them, what I mean, of course, is militarily, right? And Lincoln has almost no military experience. I talked about his Black Hawk War service. That's the only service Lincoln ever has, and they see no combat. So Lincoln has no combat experience, he has no strategic experience, he has no tactical experience, and now he is going to preside over the largest war ever fought in the Western Hemisphere. So, right, what do you do with that, right? Well, given what we've learned about Lincoln, what do you think Lincoln does? Lincoln gets to Washington and immediately begins studying the art of warfare. He checks books, he literally does the same thing he did when he was younger learning to be a lawyer. He goes to the Library of Congress and he checks books out <laughs> on military strategy and military theory so that he could be an effective commander in chief. He of course also um, borrows from the military commanders around him, right? He gets them to help him 
um, learn how to manage a war. And he'll have his ups and downs that way. Um, some he'll have a rough relationship with some of his major commanders. The the big the the most notable example being uh, George McClellan, who Lincoln will put in charge of all Union forces. Although McClellan will mostly focus on the war in Virginia, Lincoln and McClellan do not get along. And McClellan deserves a lot of the blame for that, but Lincoln does too. Lincoln doesn't really know how to handle him. Lincoln learns as the war goes on, right? How many times do I keep saying this, right? Lincoln, as the war goes on, Lincoln gets more and more comfortable in the role of commander in chief, ultimately leading to the very positive and collaborative relationship he'll have with Ulysses S. Grant, which is a large part of uh, why Union victory happens the way it does. I'm almost at 1040 and I wanna have some time for Q&A, but there's one last element of Lincoln being open to self-improvement that I think is a, a really key component of the Lincoln story that we're talking about more a lot uh, in the public sphere, but not as much as we should. And that is Lincoln's attitude towards African-Americans because Lincoln's views on race absolutely evolved during the Civil War. It's, a, it's the up besides his military experience, that's another thing that changes. We don't really know, um, I don't think we really know still whether Lincoln believed in racial equality the way we would define it today. Um, there's a lot of people ask about whether, you know, the, 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 a common question that's being asked, especially in the last few years over debates about monuments and things, whether Lincoln was a racist, right? That's a difficult question to answer because um, I, we don't really know if Lincoln thought that like most white Americans at the time, right? The vast majority of white Americans believed that there was a fundamental difference between African Americans and white Americans, right? Um, whether Lincoln was one of them or not, we don't really know. We, we know that like, often the quotes that are used to show that Lincoln wasn't aren't really about African Americans, they're about slavery. And we do know that Lincoln opposed slavery almost his entire life because he tells us several times. And I've, I've got some quotes. Um, in 1854, Lincoln said, slavery is founded on in the selfishness of man's nature. Opposition to it is in his love of justice. These principles are an eternal antagonism. And when brought into collision so fiercely as slavery extension brings them, shocks and throws and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. Repeal the Missouri Compromise, repeal all compromises, repeal the Declaration of Independence, repeal all past history, you still cannot repeal human nature. It still will be the abundance of man's heart that slavery extension is wrong. And out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth will continue to speak. So again, Lincoln is making a moral argument against the extension of slavery, which as I said, was a major part of his platform. Around that same time, the 1850s, Lincoln writes a note to himself. We think it's from the 1850s. It's actually in our collection here. It's one of my favorite Lincoln documents. And this is all it says. Lincoln says, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Here's one last letter. This is in 1864. So this is well into the Civil War. It's in April of 1864. So it's a year before Lincoln's death. And Lincoln writes, to, um, uh, Lincoln writes to someone, he says, I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. And yet I have never understood that the presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling. That last sentence is important and this is what I wanna get into, right? So notice in all those quotes I gave you, what Lincoln is opposing in those quotes is the institution of slavery, right? He's not saying much about race in those, um, in those statements. And so, like I said, I'm not sure in 1860, when Lincoln gets elected president, I'm not sure how Lincoln um, really feels about African-Americans. We know from other speeches he gives that he believes African-Americans probably deserve the same um, fundamental rights as white Americans. Um, there's another famous quote from Lincoln that I didn't write down here where he, he says, you know, we originally said all men are created equal. We can now say all men are created equal except Negroes. And then he goes on to say, you know, and that will get more and more people won't have equal rights, right? So he, he says multiple times, he thinks black people deserve the same rights that white people do. 
Again, whether that means he thinks black people are equal to white people, we don't really know. What we do know is if you look at how Lincoln um, not only acts, but the policies he adopts during the Civil War, you can see an evolution. Um, when the war begins, as I've emphasized, all Lincoln is saying is slavery cannot extend further westward. Now, the ultimate object of that policy is to get rid of slavery. What, what Lincoln and other Republicans believe is that if you keep slavery where it is, it will eventually die out on its own. So again, he's trying to get rid of the institution of slavery. But what does he think should happen to the enslaved people once they're free? Well, that's more complicated. One of the things Lincoln thinks enslaved people should do when they're free is go back to Africa or go somewhere else. Lincoln says multiple times that he's not sure that white and black people can live harmoniously together. Now, again, is that motivated by racism? We don't know. It's partly motivated by Lincoln's belief that African Americans are going to be so aggrieved because they've been enslaved for so long that you know violence will break out, or that their former enslavers will just be too uncomfortable to live around them and violence will break out. But what happens over time? Well, as the war goes on, right, a couple of things happen. One, the Confederates fight very well, right? The, the, the war is difficult for the Union to win. Lincoln originally approaches the Confederacy with kid gloves. Lincoln does not target slavery or freeing enslaved people as part of the Union war effort. But as the war goes on, he'll target it more and more. Part of this is militarily motivated, right? Because he knows that enslaved property is being used to help the Confederate war effort. But part of it is also being motivated by the actions of African-Americans around Lincoln and on the ground. African Americans begin to flee their enslavement in huge numbers during the Civil War. They reach the Union Army and they ask if they can be let past the Union lines and help the Union war effort. That tells Union soldiers on the ground all the way up to Abraham Lincoln that African Americans want their freedom, right? And that they, they, um, they want to help the Union war effort, right? That starts to change attitudes about African Americans, at least in Lincoln's mind. The other thing that starts to happen is Lincoln in DC. Now Lincoln knew African-American people here in Springfield, but there's much more, there's a much larger African-American population in, in DC that Lincoln begins to surround himself with. Um, and this is what we call the, there's a black middle class in DC. There's a, there's a group of very well-educated African-Americans in Washington who are politically motivated, who have access to the president. People like Elizabeth Keckley, his seamstress, who writes a wonderful memoir after the war that I recommend everybody read called Behind the Scenes. He gets access to Frederick Douglass, right, who is what, who's the most prominent um, African-American political activist in America at the time. This also starts to change Lincoln's attitudes about African-Americans. By the summer of 1862, right, Lincoln has decided he needs to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. So we got to target um, slavery directly, right? He's doing this as commander in chief. So that's why it only applies to areas still under rebellion. He doesn't have the power to end slavery on his own under the Constitution. And then he'll issue it on January 1st, 1863. But a component, and I'll, this is the last thing I want to stress, but a component of the Emancipation Proclamation is it further um, allows for African-American men, because women couldn't serve at all, African-American men to enlist in the US Army. That also has a profound effect on Abraham Lincoln, right? African-Americans, once they join the Union Army, serve very well. It takes a while before they can actually get into combat. Initially, the Union Army keeps them behind the lines, you know, guarding supplies and things. But, um, they're but African American soldiers are eventually able to see combat. Uh, most famously, the 54th Massachusetts at uh, Battery Wagner, which is what the movie Glory is about. And these stories reach the Northern press that African Americans are enlisting in the Union Army in huge numbers and they're fighting very well. How do we know this affects Abraham Lincoln? Well, in the very last speech Lincoln ever gives, just a few days before he's assassinated, all right, Richmond has surrendered. Robert E. Lee is, has been defeated. And, and Lincoln goes to visit Richmond uh, after it surrenders, right, the Confederate capital. And when he gets back, people come to the White House and they want to make a speech about what he thinks the, the nation will look like after the war. And Lincoln gives what will become his final speech. But of course, Lincoln doesn't know that. And Lincoln says in that speech that um, one of the things he's envisioning for the nation after the war is that African-American, at least African-American veterans should be given the right to vote. This is the first time in American history a president has ever advocated for African-Americans receiving the franchise. 
It's a radical step forward. And again, it shows a change. Lincoln never advocated for this any other time in his life, right? Lincoln is suddenly has a, suddenly by 1865, Lincoln has enough confidence in African Americans as intelligent people, as patriots, and whatever else that he's willing to grant them the right to vote or to advocate for them to have the right to vote. It's such a radical position that in the audience that night is John Wilkes Booth. And up to that time, John Wilkes Booth wanted to kidnap Abraham Lincoln and ransom him for Confederate independence. After hearing that Lincoln wants to give African Americans the right to vote, he turns to his friend and he says, that means N-word citizenship, now I have to run him through. And of course, Booth does precisely that just a few days later. So Lincoln's capacity for growth during the Civil War allows him to change, you know, likely change his attitude on African Americans as the war progresses, but it also ultimately gets him assassinated. John Wilkes Booth, the reason John Wilkes Booth assassinates Abraham Lincoln is expressly because of Booth's white supremacy and Abraham Lincoln's resistance to white supremacy. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there because I wanna have some time for questions. But um, yeah, I hope I hope that was uh, I hope that was useful, insightful to you, and you got some examples of. What I, what I really respect about Lincoln, which is that capacity for him to grow and learn uh, uh, throughout his life. So thank you very much. I have gotten a little bit of feedback that my audio is distorted. So, um, but that uh, Christian sounds just fine and loud and clear. So I'm gonna try to facilitate the question, but um, please bear with me if my audio doesn't sound the way it should. Uh, Marilyn has her hand up. Go ahead, Marilyn. Yeah, so I was wondering what uh, was Abraham Lincoln's uh, lineage? Like, uh, did his ancestors come from Europe? What part of Europe? Uh, and did he have any Native American uh, ancestry? So Abraham Lincoln, um, Abraham Lincoln's family comes from Lincoln uh, in, in Great Britain. Um, and there's a whole bunch of them in that town. And they come over to Massachusetts uh, when it's still a colony very early. We're talking, you know, during that flood of colonists that come after the Mayflower um, in the mid 17th century. Um, they settle in the town of Hingham, H-I-N-G-H-M. Um, and if you look at documents from Hingham, and we only have a couple in our collection, they're just full of people with the last name Lincoln. Um, but, uh, but they do what a lot of um, early Americans do um, and they're transient. So they, uh, they remain in Hingham for a little while. So I'm talking about Lincoln's direct descendants, not the whole bunch of Lincoln's. Mm -hmm. Lincoln's direct descendants. Um, they leave Hingham uh, and end up in Virginia for a little while. Um, and then like a lot of colonial Virginians, uh, white uh, colonial Virginians, they move to Kentucky, um, which is when you catch up with Thomas. That's where Thomas is when Lincoln is born. Um, and then Kentuckians, um, colonial settlers in Kentucky, tend to go in all kinds of different directions. And a lot of them do kind of that Kentucky to Illinois or Kentucky to Indiana or Kentucky to Indiana to Illinois pipeline. Those are all things that these settlers do. Um, and, uh, and Lincoln follows that trend as well. Um, and of course, Lincoln's descendants will finish that, right? I, I, um, Lincoln only has one child who lives to adulthood. That's Robert. Robert will live in Chicago for a while, but then he'll eventually settle in Vermont. Um, and that's where they'll stay. They'll stay on the East Coast until the early 80s when, one of, when Lincoln's last uh, direct descendant dies. There are no direct descendants of Abraham Lincoln left alive. Um, your second question was if Lincoln, uh, if there was any indigenous people in Lincoln's uh, history. No. Um, and in fact, there's a, the, you know, Lincoln and one of the most controversial parts of Lincoln's story is Lincoln's relationship with indigenous people. Um, you know, I mentioned the Black Hawk War. Lincoln also presides over the largest mass execution in American history, um, which is when 38 um, uh, Dakota are hung um, due to a, a, a rebellion in Minnesota during the Civil War. Um, Lincoln pardons, it would have been even worse. There would have been hundreds of them hung. Lincoln pardons most of them, but then ends up hanging 38 of them. And that's a very controversial part of Lincoln's story. But Lincoln's uh, grandfather is killed by uh, Native Americans. Um, they're, uh, uh, and Lincoln's father witnesses this. Um, they're, they're out working the field one day and the story, I hope I don't mangle the story, but the story is basically a, a Native American, an indigenous person comes out of the woods around their farm and murders um, Lincoln's grandfather. So 
there's a there's a history of conflict with indigenous people as there were for many white colonial settlers um, in Lincoln's background. So, and there's all kinds of debate. I mean, you know, I will also to, to just get, there's all kinds of debate over, because like I said, you know, as you know, if you've done genealogical research, there's there's all kinds of gray areas there. So whether Lincoln's family has, you know, some, in, you know, indigenous roots or African-American roots, is something people still argue about, but there isn't any, you know, uh, concrete evidence that I'm aware of. So anybody else? So Marilyn Hitler um, wrote in the chat that um, she, her cousin is Sidney Blumenthal, who is also a Lincoln scholar and wants to know if you've read any of his books. Yeah, I hit, um, so yeah, his his biographies of Abraham Lincoln, he's writing a series of them. I don't think he's finished yet, right? It's going to be multiple volumes. Um, I was able to meet him um, when he gave a talk at the uh, the Lincoln Forum, which is a, a, a large Lincoln symposium that's hosted at Gettysburg around the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address every year, uh, and he was one of the speakers. Um, but I haven't, I haven't corresponded with him to help him with those books uh, directly myself, but uh, but yeah, he's out there and, and oh, and he gave it, actually, I shouldn't say, he gave a talk here as well, but I was away, so I wasn't able to attend that. But uh, he, yeah, he's, he's, he's in our twice. orbit. Yeah, he has spoken twice in St. Louis. And, okay. and um, in fact, my dad is mentioned in his, um, uh, in his book, in the early right. pages as the person who introduced him to Springfield and his love of, Lincoln. So that was kind of cool. But yeah. I believe the fourth book is finished and he was it was only supposed to be a series of four, but I think yeah. he may be working on a fifth. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um it is it's one of the real fun parts actually of this job is that I've gotten to meet a lot of um Lincoln scholars from all walks of life, either, you know, people involved in politics and journalism like uh like Sydney, but also, you know, emerging scholars like I was. I came here when I was a grad student and, and researched my own dissertation. Um, so it's always happy to help those folks out too. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to work that way. You get to meet all kinds of um, different kinds of scholars interested in Lincoln and the Civil War. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, I have to say that I wrote down the importance of reading keep yeah. learning and keep evolving and work, work, work. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Abraham Lincoln, his story is so inspiring. Thank you, Dr. McWhorter, for sharing his story and the life lessons today with us. I've already asked Christian to come back and do a part two, and he said yes, so stay tuned. <laughs> he will be back. Um, and I'm going to check out your book. I just think oh, thank you. this is just such a fascinating topic. Um, and I never knew that his last speech was the cause of his death. So um, I learned um, some new information today. Um, let's see, um, people are saying that it was a really nice talk and they learned a lot. Um, and Barbara Furman, um, we only have a few more minutes, but she does want to know if you know John Simon. I never got to meet John Y. Simon, but I know lots of people who did. I'm, I'm friends with several of his grad students. Um, but yeah, he's a legend in, in the Lincoln field and in the Grant field, right? He, he was the editor of the Ulysses S. Grant papers for a long time um, and uh, uh, had a controversial relationship with this museum. If you're interested, he was a very opinionated guy. And if you wanna, um, if you're interested in any of the controversy when this museum was built, um, John Y. Simon did not like the way we decide to interpret Abraham Lincoln. And so there's some newspaper articles out there where he's really coming after us. So uh, you, can, you can get some spicy takes from him if you want to try and find that stuff online. Marilyn, if you have one last question, um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, I remember reading a letter many years ago in Charleston. Um, where, where the battle was held, something to the effect that Lincoln wrote that he did not believe in slavery. However, he did not feel, if I'm remembering it correctly, he did not feel that the African-American 
was equal yeah. to the white person uh, in, oh, how can I phrase this, in mental capacity. So that's that quote is used a lot, and that's probably Lincoln. There's two interact. There's two times where Lincoln says things about African Americans that are pretty rough. Um, one of them is not that quote. One of them is um, a group of African Americans uh, come to visit Abraham Lincoln in the White House, which is significant. He was the first president to have African Americans officially visit him in the White House. Of course, most African Americans who would have been in the White House before that time were enslaved, right? And so that's significant. But one of these first groups that he, he kind of lectures them on how he's doubtful that they can live among white people and kind of encourages them to colonize. He never does that again, though. And by the end of the war, it looks like Lincoln has mostly moved away from colonization and he's advocating black citizenship. The quote you're talking about is actually from his debates with Stephen Douglas, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And Douglas, Douglas race baits Lincoln, what we would call playing the race card, throughout that um, throughout those debates. He's trying to characterize Lincoln as an abolitionist, um, which is not something Lincoln ever wants to be characterized as, right? There's a difference between someone who opposes slavery and an abolitionist. An abolitionist believes that slavery should end immediately. It doesn't matter whether the Constitution allows it, it just has to end right away. Lincoln is never that way, right? Lincoln always uses the Constitution to get rid of the institution of slavery, ultimately through the 13th Amendment, a constitutional amendment. Um, and Douglas keeps playing the race card and trying to show that Lincoln is a radical and that Lincoln believes in black equality. And in one of those speeches, Lincoln very carefully but does makes a statement that essentially says I, he's never said he's in favor of black equality. So he's really, you know, he's really threading the needle there. <laughs> um, and you can interpret that whether Lincoln actually believes that or whether Lincoln is just trying to dodge the question. But that quote is used a lot. Um, but around that same time, this is where history is complicated. And that's, so that's in 1858 during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. In those same years is where a lot of those quotes I said, uh, similar to quotes I gave you come from, where Lincoln is also going around and he's constantly talking about the evils of slavery. He's talking about how he believes the, the beginning of the Declaration of Independence applies to African-Americans as well as white people. Um, so it's complicated. My answer to that would be it's, it's complicated and Lincoln's a politician and he needs to try to win an election. And the Lincoln-Douglas debates are, remember, a campaign for Lincoln to um, take Douglas's Senate seat from him. Um, so it's complicated, but yeah, that's the quote you're thinking of. It's, it's from uh, one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates in Charles. Thank you. Sure. Well, I am aware of the time. I just want to take the opportunity to thank Dr. McWhorter again. Um, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum is driving distance from here. I have been there. And now I want to go back even more after hearing today's presentation. Um, so thank you again uh, to you for speaking with us. And thank you, everyone, for being here. All right. Thank you. Take care.